Hello, my name is Shahriyar Shahriyari, and this is a lecture in a series of lectures on abstract algebra based on my book, Algebra in Action, a course in groups, rings, and fields. This is an introductory lecture giving you a sense of what abstract algebra is. Abstract algebra, the way we think of it today as a coherent subject with its own methods, techniques, questions, and subject area, was basically developed in the beginning of the 20th century. In this set of lectures, we will focus on groups, then rings, and finally fields. Each of these objects, groups, rings, and fields, has its own longer history, going much further back than the 20th century, and they were originally developed separately. In the 18th and 19th century, real advances were made in many of these areas through the works of many mathematicians, including Euler, Gauss, Sophie Germain, Lagrange, Galois, Abel, Chronicle, Dedekind, Hilbert, and Amy Noether. But putting them together as a coherent discipline is what happened in the beginning of the 20th century. And one very influential figure in this regard was Emmy Noether. In this particular lecture, we'll tell you a little bit about abstract algebra and algebraic structures first, then a little bit more about each of groups, rings, and, and fields. And in the process, there will be a little bit about the connection to algebra, the kind you learned in middle school and high school. Abstract algebra is really the study of algebraic structures. But what is an algebraic structure? An example that you may have seen if you have studied linear algebra is vector spaces. A vector space is a set with two operations, an addition and a scalar multiplication. And these operations satisfy certain rules. Examples of vector spaces may be very familiar to you. R3, our three-dimensional world, for example. Polynomials of degree less than or equal to five is another vector space. The set of three by three matrices with real entries or functions from R to R are all examples of vector spaces. On the other hand, the abstract study of vector spaces is not really about studying any particular example of a vector space. Such a study gleans a lot from looking at examples, but in the end of the day, it's really about studying vector spaces in the abstract. What, what makes it abstract is that we don't really know what the elements of the set are or what the operations are. You just know that you have a set and there is a way to do addition and a way to do a scalar multiplication. And these operations follow certain rules. And then you want to see what you can say. I actually have a whole full course on linear algebra on YouTube. And because of that, in these abstract algebra lectures, we will actually not focus on vector spaces. A second example of an algebraic structure, one that we will study in detail in upcoming videos, is groups. A group is just a set together with one operation. And the operation has four puny properties. It has to be closed. It has to be associative. There's an identity element and every element has an inverse. In some sense, this is a very bare bones algebraic object, just a set and just one operation. We do not a priori know what the elements of the set are and we do not know what the operations are. Rings are another algebraic structure. This is a set with two operations. We usually call them addition and multiplication. And again, they follow certain rules. And fields are a special case of rings where we have four arithmetic operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division by non-zero elements. And both operations, addition and multiplication, are commutative. And there are other algebraic structures, modules, algebras, groupoids, and so on. And each of these studied separately in abstract algebra. At this point, you don't need to know or understand much about these structures. Rather, I want to focus on the overall project of abstract algebra. An algebraic structure, as we have been saying, is a set of elements together with certain operations on them and certain rules that operations have to follow. Without knowing what the elements are or what the operations are, just by focusing on the rules, we want to see what we can prove. When we are trying to apply abstract algebra or to gain insight from examples, then we certainly are interested in what the elements of our algebraic structure are and what the operations are. However, when developing the abstract theory of, say, groups, we want our theory to apply to all groups and not just one example of a group. Now, why would we do that? Why would we study an algebraic structure in the abstract? This is a good question. And regardless of what I say, you should reserve judgment and decide for yourself after seeing the power of this abstract theory, whether it was worth the effort. One reason for studying a vector space or a group or a ring in abstract is that the results are versatile. There are many examples of vector spaces or groups or rings. And so if you can say something about groups in general, then it applies to all of them. So instead of proving the same thing over and over again, for many different manifestations of group, you prove them once for all and for all of them. But maybe more importantly, by fo focusing on just one narrow aspect of a mathematical object, you can block out distracting information and focus just on the right thing. Of course, that all depends on what you want to do and whether you've picked the right focus. 
Mathematics actually puts a premium on focusing on very specific aspects of an object. And that's unlike other disciplines where you may need to do the opposite. In, in many disciplines, unless you look at an object holistically and comprehensively, you will miss many of the features. Mathematics goes a different route by focusing on very specific and narrow aspects of a phenomena. For example, if you study a group, you're focusing on one operation and group theory tells you what you can and cannot say about that one aspect. Surely you have to be convinced that this approach is fruitful, but it ends up being much more fruitful than one may first expect. Of course, in mathematics, connections matter a lot as well. And in fact, you can get a lot by looking at an object and realizing that you can think of it as both as a ring and as a vector space. But to begin our study in this set of lectures, we like to focus on one particular aspect. One valid objection may be that the definition of the group is too general, void of specifics. We have a set with one operation and the four properties are very meager. They're very weak. How could we possibly prove something profound and beyond the surface? Don't we need more information to be able to come up with insights that are worth something? What on earth are you going to prove just by knowing that you have a set, an operation, and that operation is closed associative as an identity and inverses? In fact, what's exciting about group theory is that you can start from such meager beginnings and build a whole edifice full of unexpected, profound, and deep insights. For example, we can prove that there's actually only one group with 167 elements, but there are, on the other hand, 57 groups with 168 elements and two groups, exactly two groups with 169 elements. In these lectures, you will see a proof why there's only one group of order 167 and two groups with 169 elements. You'll also be able to construct many groups with 160 elements, although the exact count will be beyond what we'll cover in this introductory course. Abstract algebra as a discipline emphasizes the common approaches to algebraic structures. There's certain productive ways that you can tackle all algebraic objects. I'm going to mention some of these, but these will be a little bit vague at this point. But as we go through the lectures in this course, all of these will become more clear. For example, instead of focusing on the individual elements of your set, you focus on substructures within your set. And you try to formulate uh, all your questions and answers in terms of substructures instead of elements. We will come back to this theme over and over again. Another common approach is to look at functions and collections of functions on your algebraic object. Especially productive are the functions that work well with the operations on your set. Any such function, more importantly, the set of all such functions tells you a lot about uh, an algebraic ob object. We will talk about homomorphisms and isomorphisms quite a bit as we study each object. A third approach is to see the interactions of your object with other objects. In group three, for example, the idea of actions of groups on sets will be central to our understanding of, of groups themselves. Representation theory is a general approach for doing this, for finding versions of your algebraic object in other more manageable algebraic objects. Now, beyond the common approach, when you get deeper into studying any one of these algebraic objects, you will notice that everyone has a unique personality. Every one of these algebraic objects is different from the other ones. Certainly their origins and their histories are different, and each one was developed separately. But you also need different kinds of more specialized techniques for studying each one of these algebraic objects. And you have to develop different kinds of intuition. The intuition you develop for groups is going to be different than the one you need for rings or for fields. And you have to get a feel for how each behaves, what kinds of questions are good questions, and what kinds of techniques are useful in these set of lectures will want to go deep enough in both groups and rings and later in fields to appreciate the depth of the subject. Not only we will talk about what is common among the various objects, but for each of them, we'll also develop more specialized techniques. This will hopefully give you a sense of power and depth of abstract algebra. I want to now tell you a little bit about the origins of groups, rings, and fields. For what I am going to say, you don't need to really know what these things are. I basically told you what groups, rings, and fields are, but don't worry about if that just went right over your head. That's fine. That's the way it's supposed to be at this point. You will learn all of that in future lectures. I want to quickly give you the definitions, but then focus on what questions gave rise to these subjects. Don't worry if the definitions aren't completely transparent at this point. Instead, we are going to focus on the historical origins of these subjects. So groups, let's start with that. I'm going to repeat myself and tell you what a group is. A group is a set with one operation, and that operation has four properties. We usually call the operation multiplication, but you can call it FRED if you want. It's not necessarily the multiplication of numbers that you're used to. What matters is that the operation has four properties. 
it's closed. This means that if you take two elements and apply the operation, multiply the two elements together, the result will still be an element in your set. So AB is another element in your group if A and B are in G. It's associative. That means that AB times C is the same as A times BC. The, the operation doesn't have to be commutative. AB does not have to be the same as BA. Even though this is a property of multiplication of numbers, we're not assuming it for this kind of general multiplication. And in fact, there are many interesting questions about commutivity in general groups. Sometimes, for example, it's forced. Other times, it's not. There has to be an identity. That means that one of the elements has to step up to the plate and have this one property that if you multiply it by other elements, if you multiply it by A, for example, you get A back again. Now you might say, well, that's not really stepping up. That's just being lazy, but you need an element like that. In the usual multiplication of numbers, the number one plays that role. Every element has to have an inverse. This means that for every element A, there's another element that when you multiply the two together, you get that identity. In the videos following this one, what we will do is that we'll go through many examples of groups before the abstract study of groups. We use groups to study symmetries. A mathematician's approach to symmetry is true groups. And by symmetry, we mean all kinds of symmetry. We mean symmetries of geometric objects, like symmetries of a square or a cube, but also symmetries of theories or symmetries in other places. For example, maybe you have a cube and 47 colors, and you want to assign a color to each face of the cube. You want to color this face maybe red, maybe that face yellow, and so forth. You could use red for all the faces, or maybe yellow for two adjacent ones, green for two opposing faces, and purple for the rest. You may want to know in how many ways, how many different ways, can you color the cube? The tricky part is that if you color the cube in one way and I color the cube in a supposedly different way, then we should be able to tell them apart if we rotate the cubes or say if we drop them under the table and then pick them up. This is a harder problem than you may think and requires group theory since it depends on the symmetries of a cube, the different ways you can rotate a cube. I will also give you a historical problem that led to the advent of group theory. Can we solve x to the fifth minus 10x plus 5 equals 0? Meaning that can you find a number x that satisfies this equation? If this was not a fifth degree equation, if it was not a quintic, but it was a quadratic, then you know from high school the quadratic formula. Babylonians knew how to solve a quadratic equation 400 years before the Common Era. They didn't really work with equations, and they certainly did not use notations similar to ours, but they solved problems, word problems, that we translate to quadratic equations, and their solutions amount to completing the square, which is what we use to get the quadratic formula. They did not consider negative solutions. Indian mathematicians, including Brahmagupta in the 7th century, did include negative quantities and solved these equations in ways very similar to ours. In the Islamic world, in the 8th and 9th century, algebra was developed as a subject distinct from ge geometry. Of course, ge algebraic problems were solved earlier, but it was in this period that algebra became its own subject. The word algebra comes from the Arabic. Al is just the definite article, the, and jabr translates to restoration or completion. If in an equation, one side is missing something, you can add that quantity to both sides. You can restore it on one side as long as you add it to the other. This operation is what al, al jabr means. One of the first books devoted to algebra was Al-Kitab al-Muhtasar fi Hesab al-Jab wal muqabile written by Muhammad ibn Musa al-Kharazmi, who lived towards the end of the um, century and the first half of the 9th century. He worked in Baghdad, but most likely he's from Central Asia, and he was born to a Persian family. He possibly had a Zoroastrian family because he was referred to as Al-Majusi at some point. However, not a whole lot is known about Kharazmi, but his book was very popular, but both in the Islamic world as well as later in Europe. And in the book, he devotes quite a bit of space to solving the quadratic equation, both geometrically and algebraic. Um, this book and others in that tradition had quite a bit of effect in introducing algebra as a standalone discipline. The algebra that you know from high school is mostly the algebra developed in the Islamicate world. They wrote everything out and did not use notation like us, but the essence of the mathematics is the same as they developed. There was quite a bit of interest in going further and solving the cubic equation. One major advance was recorded by Omar Khayyam. He was a great poet, but his day job was mathematics. He solved cubic equations geometrically by using conic sections. You gave Khayyam a cubic equation, and he would give you a circle and a parabola whose point of intersection would be the solution to the cubic. Cubic and quartic equations, quartics are fourth degree equations, were not solved algebraically until the 16th century 
century in the Italian city-states. Cardano was the first to publish this solution, not his own work, but based on the work of Tartaglia, Ferro, and Ferrari. Back then, you would not automatically publish or broadcast new results that you found in mathematics. Those would be trade secrets, and you would not want other people to know about them. You would convince others and wealthy benefactors that you actually knew how to do something that others didn't know through challenge. You would show up at the town square or at the university and respond to challenges. If you could actually solve a few cubics that you were presented with, and testing a solution is a lot easier than actually finding it, then you would be believed. Tartaglia, for example, beat Ferro in such a competition. Cardano learned the solution from Tartaglia, promised that he wouldn't publish it, but after some years he found an excuse, mainly that Ferro had a partial solution earlier than Tartaglia, to publish it, together with the solution toward it by his own student, Ferrari. Ferrari apparently challenged Tartaglia to a competition, but Tartaglia didn't participate, and his reputation suffered as a result. By the way, quartic, the fourth degree equation, was not thought at the time as important. Cardano put the solution of the quartic at the end of his book, even though it was actually harder to solve than the cubic. He put it at the end as sort of an appendix. The reason for that is applicability. People thought that quadratic equations are useful because they come up in problems having to do with areas, because when you multiply two sides to Together, like the, the area of a square, you get x squared. Cubics theoretically could come up when you're dealing with volumes, but who on earth is ever going to want to solve a quartic? So at the time, they thought quartics would not be useful at all. Mathematics is often ahead of applications and is developed way before uses are known. Now, starting in the 16th century, mathematicians were interested in quintic equations of degree 5, such as x to the fifth minus 10x plus 5 equals 0. It took a long time to resolve the issue of solving a quintic. Two mathematicians who did crucial work in this regard and both died tragically when they were young were Norwegian mathematician Niels Abel and the French mathematician Galois. I will leave their stories quite fascinating when we do Galois theory. These two independently got major results regarding the quintic. Galois actually went much further, but they actually focused on the symmetries among the roots of an equation. In fact, you can say group theory was invented to understand the symmetries inherent among the roots of algebraic equations. What they showed, and spoiler alert, is that not only there is no general formula for solving quintics, but particular equations such that x to the fifth minus 10x plus 5 equals 0 cannot be solved using the usual algebraic techniques. In some sense, not only you can't solve this equation, you can't even write down the solution in a reasonable way. If you're about to use the four arithmetic operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, as well as repeated use of as many nth roots as you want, like cube roots, square roots, tenth roots, you can't write write down the solution. In the quadratic equation, you use square roots to write the answer. And that makes sense because it's a quadratic equation. You assume that at some point you have to take a square root. For a fifth degree equation, we allow you to use addition, multiplication, subtraction, division, and any kind of root you want, not just the fifth root, but fourth root, third root, tenth root, eleventh root, any combination of them you want. And you still won't be able not only to solve this, but you won't be able to write down what the solution is. This impossibility was proved using group theory and field theory. Here's a final example of a problem that we can solve using group theory. Say that you have a set with 47 elements. Now, script A is the set, but its elements are one-to-one -one onto functions bijections from X to X. And you assume that you know two things about this set of one-to-one -one onto functions. You know that given functions in your collection, their composition is also in your collection. Is F and G are in your collection, then F circle G is also a, a function in your collection. And and you also know that the number of functions that you have, the number of bijections you have is 169. Then the conclusion you can get using group theory, and this is amazing that you can prove this, is that f of g of x is g of f of x for all functions in your collection, that it doesn't matter which way you compose the functions, you will always get the same thing. That's unusual. If I give you just a random set of functions, this is not going to happen, that it doesn't matter which way you compose them. But if you have 169 bijections with the property that if you compose any two of them, the result is also in your collection, then it has to have this commutative property. I, I, I urge you to try to prove this. We will prove this not that far in the future in this set of lectures, but it's surprising that that can be done. And it's not at all obvious because this is not true if instead of 169, if you have 168 or 170 bijections, then it would just not be true. It would be very possible to come up with an example where that's not the case. Moving on to rings, 
There's a different history for rings. So let me remind you what a ring is. A ring is a set with two operations, which we call addition and multiplication. In the ring, you can add, you can subtract, and you can multiply elements, but you don't necessarily can divide. The prototypical example of a ring is the ring of integers. You can add integers, you can multiply integers, you can't divide integers. Like if you take two divided by three, you get two thirds. That's not an integer anymore. And again, these operations follow certain rules. Don't worry about the details at this point, but basically, with addition, we have a commutative group. And with multiplication, we only have associativity and closure. You also need distributive laws to connect addition and multiplication. Again, what exactly rings are will become clear in the lectures on rings. But right now, I'm just interested in telling you where these rings come from. Ring theory originated differently, again, from solving equation, but a very different kind of equation, so-called Diophantine equations. Diophantus is from the third century. An example of a Diophantine equation is z cubed minus y cubed equals two. You want to solve this equation, but the important thing about a Diophantine equation is that you're interested not in all solutions, you're just interested in integer solutions. So you want z and y to be integers, and when you cube z and square y and subtract them, you get two. Another way of saying that is that you want to find two integers that are two apart. The bigger one is a cube and the smaller one is a square. Is that possible? And the answer in this case is yes, 25 and 27 are two apart. 27 is three cubed and 25 is is five or minus five squared. So z equals three and y equals plus or minus five work. But are there other solutions? If you can find all integer solutions to z cubed minus y squared equals two, then you have solved this particular Diophantine equation. Maybe the most famous Diophantine equation is the one from Fermat's last theorem. Fermat's last theorem says that there are no non-trivial integer solutions to x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n when n is greater than two. So you choose n greater than two, maybe you pick n to be 47. Then you want x to the 47 plus y to the 47 to be z to the 47. Of course, you could pick x to be zero and y and z to be equal to each other, but this is a trivial solution. So you want solutions where none of x, y, or z are zero. Fermat claimed that there are no solutions. He didn't have a proof, even though he wrote in the margins of his copy of Diophantus's book that he had a marvelous proof for which the margin was too small. It took 350 years for mathematicians to develop enough theory to fill in that margin and come up with a proof. The final chapter of that work was by Andrew Wiles, with help from a student of his, Richard Taylor, in 1995. It was based on the work of hundreds of mathematicians over a very long period of time, and settling Fermat's question was one of the major achievements of 20th century mathematics. Problems and conjecture fuel the development of mathematics all the time. A pattern is noticed, a conjecture is made, and a proof is not apparent. Mathematicians work at it for a long time and solve it. Often the final answer itself is not that important, but the techniques and ideas that went into solution end up being very important. Fermat's little puzzle is a case in point. Actually knowing that x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n has no non-trivial solutions for n greater than two doesn't buy you anything. There's no applications or uses for this fact. It's very hard to monetize this result. However, the mathematics that was developed in the process, including ring theory and other parts of algebra, has been extremely useful. Now, what do rings have to do with solving Diophantine equations? Since we are interested in integer solutions, it's not surprising that we need to do number theory. And what that means is that you have to know things about prime numbers, about divisibility, about factoring integers, and so on. But you realize rather quickly that even though you're just interested in integer solutions, you have to be able to do number theory kind of arguments with a larger class of numbers, larger than the ordinary integers. For example, given two integers, actual integers, you can divide one by the other and you can get a quotient and remainder with the remainder being smaller than what you divided by. You can find greatest common divisors and least common multiples. You can factor integer into a product of primes and except for reordering, that factorization is unique. Ring theory is what allows you to do these things in largest classes of numbers, including possibly ones that contain complex numbers. And ring theory becomes indispensable for working on Diophantine equations. I do want to emphasize that Diophantine equations can be very difficult. It took 350 years to resolve Fermat's last theorem. But why? Why is that so hard? Here's an interesting example. Fermat himself proved the case n equals 4, that x to the 4th plus y to the 4th equals z to the 4th has no non-trivial integer solutions. Euler later proved the harder case when n equals 3, 
that x cubed plus y cubed because z cubed has no non-trivial integer solutions. Euler then went on to conjecture that x to the fourth plus y to the fourth plus z to the fourth equal w to the fourth should also not have a, any non-trivial solution. And x to the fifth plus y to the fifth plus z to the fifth plus w to the fifth equals to the u to the fifth, and so on, all of them should have no non-trivial integer solutions. And this problem was open for a very long time as well. In 1966, this is one of the first applications of using computers to do math. Lander and Parkin wrote a very short paper and disproved Euler's conjecture. Their paper was two sentences and five lines. And all it says is that 27 to the fifth power plus 84 to the fifth power plus 110 to the fifth power plus 133 to the fifth power equals 144 to the fifth power. And later on, people came up with other examples, including for that fourth degree equation. The problem with Diophantine equations is that some combinations of seemingly random set of integers can satisfy certain properties and others can't. And the theory has to be developed enough to be able to handle all these quirky examples. And that makes it very complicated. Finally, let's talk about fields. The field is a set where you can do all four arithmetic operations. You can add, you can subtract, you can multiply, and you can divide, although divide only by non-zero elements. And the two operations, addition and multiplications, are commutative, meaning that a plus b equals b plus a, and a times b equals b times a. At the heart of studying fields is something called Galois theory that connects the study of fields to groups. This will be a subject of a series of future lectures. Galois theory is where the study of fields and groups are brought together to, among other things, prove the unsolvability of the quintic. But the study of fields, even without groups, has dividends. The abstract theory of fields allows us to answer some very old problems that plagued humanity for about 2,000 years. In mathematics that was developed in Alexandria, Egypt, things that you could do with um, straight edge and compass were central. Straight edge is a ruler without markings. Alexandria mathematics, that includes Euclid's elements, for example, is usually referred to as Greek mathematics, since most of the mathematics was written in Greek. But for most of the actual individuals involved, we don't know if they were Greek or not. We hardly know anything about Euclid, for example. Euclid's elements is a geometry book, but it's really a book about what you can draw draw and construct using elementary methods. And that means what you can do with a compass and a straight edge. If you are already given two points in the plane, you can draw a straight edge between them, or you can open up your compass to a radius equal to the distance between those two points, and then draw a circle with center at one of those points or at some other point. When two lines, two circles, or a line and a circle intersect, then the points of intersections are new points, and you can use those points from that point on. Euclid's Elements is really a book about constructions with a straight edge and compass. The main geometry question from this perspective is, what are all the things that you can do using these elementary methods? Some classical questions that went unanswered for a very long time where can you double a cube? If you're given one edge of a cube, then can you, using straight edge and compass, construct the edge of another cube that has twice the volume? That's what doubling a cube means. Can you trisect an angle? If I give you an angle, if I draw an angle for you, can you draw a line that will divide the angle into three equal parts? Can you square a circle? If I give you a circle, can you draw a square so that the area of the square is the same as the area of the circle? All of these questions bothered humanity for a good 2,000 years. But as soon as you frame them in terms of fields, they become relatively straightforward. Spoiler alert, the answer to all three is no. You can also, using field theory, be able to answer a lot of questions that you could ask, you probably wouldn't, but you could ask in a high school algebra class. Here's an example. Is there a real number alpha such that using the rational linear combinations of one and powers of alpha, you can get every one of cube root of 47, 5th root of 17, and 18 minus 2 times 7th root of 19. Can I do that or not? This is a question we can answer after a bit of field theory. To sum it up, abstract algebra is a powerful area of mathematics that grew out of questions about equations. And these are equations that you actually may encounter in high school algebra. It's abstract, but it allows you to answer many questions. Going forward, my lectures will start by examples of groups. There's a video on D8, dihedral group of order eight, symmetries of a square, one on permutations of a set, and the symmetric group and cycle notation, a couple on integers mod n as a group, and the general linear group. So those are all examples of groups. After that, we will actually start the theory of abstract groups. But before we do that, we want to have a whole set of examples of groups to refer to. Then we turn into rings, and first I have a video 
video on why rings and the connection with Diophantine in equations. And then we have lectures on the theory of commutative rings. Finally, a whole set of lectures on theory of fields and um, Galois theory. This is the end of this lecture. Keep hydrated at all times. If you're in London, then mind the gap. And I will see you in the next lecture. Like my video and subscribe to my channel if you want to be subjected to mad videos on your feed.